story. Uh, 97.1 WWLS, the sports animal, uh, is, you know, one of our members is heavily involved in that. Great program to listen to. It's, it's the sports radio here in town. I was listening to sports radio the other day, and somebody had called in. It was an umpire, uh, a guy that had done quite a bit of uh, baseball umpiring uh, in his day. And he was calling in, and he, he was telling the story that he was umping a game, and there was a dad behind him in the bleachers a couple rows up that was just giving him the ringer. Just, oh, terrible call. You miss out. Oh, just, I mean, would not stop. Incessant, just battery from, from back behind. And, and the umpire just, just finally had enough. And he stopped the game for a second. He said, hang on. And the umpire walked out, walked around the fence, back to the bleachers, and went and sat right down beside the dad who had been yelling at him, just right beside him, and didn't talk to the dad, just looked back at the pitcher and said, pitcher, pitch. Okay, so through the first pitch, strike. Through the second pitch, strike. Then he called a ball, then he called a ball and a strike and called, a, called several pitches. And this dad's finally like, what are you doing? You can't make these calls from back here. Sometimes we make calls sitting from the wrong seat. And I've done, I've done that. Um, and, and I want to be, I feel like I'm, I'm always hesitantly willing for somebody to come and tell me, Kevin, thanks for your thoughts, but you're sitting in the wrong seat. Um, tonight, I am I'm really excited, uh, but also feel like, I, I feel like I, I'm going to the dentist uh, because I, I'm going to have a conversation that I know is necessary, but, but may not be completely pleasant all the way through and may may hit me at times. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to, I'd rather not. Um, I'd rather, I'd rather just avoid any problems that there might be and, and just go on pretending everything's okay. But we come here tonight uh, to address a topic that is as worthwhile a topic as, as maybe anything we'll talk about this summer. Uh, and, and it's the topic of race. Uh, and we have with us tonight, I believe, is, is the man who is uh, the appropriate person to have this conversation with um, from, from the staff at Oklahoma Christian University. I want to give a park welcome to Brother Gary Jones. Gary, come on out. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You bet. You bet. I, I was able to give... Uh, Gary, a tour of our of our meager facilities here. <laughs> uh, and can, uh, can I drink this or is this for decoration? I that's that's okay. just decoration. Okay. That's just decoration. No, it's all yours. I actually could use this uh, park a little. Water. This is heavenly water. It, it's the real deal. Okay. It's the real deal. It's we got it straight from the source. I don't know what that source is, but it looks it Tis looks. Is a fancy. fountain free? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Yes. <coughs> um, well, so. You may have, you've you've met a few of us. You have you know the the relationship between Oklahoma Christian and this church is goes goes deep and wide <coughs> for for a lot of people. You're good, um, and and you know members like Don Milliken who have had major impact on Definitely. on both this church and and the university. You know, we share friendships with, and um, we are uh, so we're, we're glad that you're here representing uh, Oklahoma Christian. Tell us just a tiny bit about. Uh, your role there at OC and, yeah. and how you spend your days there. Yeah, I've been at OC for about nine years, I believe. Um, currently serve as the, <clears throat> excuse me, assistant dean of students. Um, before that, several years as the multicultural and service learning coordinator. And all that long title means is that uh, I was in overseeing all things diversity. It was everything from specialized recruiting to retention to cultural sensitivity training to policy review to uh, 
like at your job where you do a whole lot more than what you were told you were going to be doing before you got there. Uh, but it, but but I loved it. I love it. Uh, I still I still do that uh, to this day. I oversee our diversity efforts on campus, and it uh, it uh, it's not always easy, uh, but it's probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever engaged in in my life. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it. There's been a lot of really neat efforts uh, happening the past few years of uh, of not just engaging with students and recruiting uh, specific students, but but bringing people to campus. To help further this this conversation mm-hmm. and and help help shine light on on different aspects of this conversation, uh, and your job has allowed you to to sit and sit at the table, sort of sort of like yeah. we're doing tonight, with some some really amazing people. Tell us tell us a couple of people that you've that you've been able to talk with and who that is and 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 how that's kind of impacted the campus and, and mm-hmm. yourself as well. So about six or seven years ago, I created a program called History Speaks. And History Speaks is a program where we bring in a, uh, a, a hero in a, in a, I mean, like a larger than life figure from uh, just associated with black history. So the first year we tried it, we tried to pull it off. Uh, we brought in two members of the Little Rock Nine. Anybody familiar with Little Rock Nine at all? So we brought in uh, uh, Claude, uh, excuse me, Carlotta Walls Lanier and Dr. Terrence Roberts of the Little Rock Nine. Uh, we have it in, in our auditorium. Uh, tickets are free. Uh, but with a, about within a week and a half time, I mean, they're gone. Um, so great, great program. Uh, from there we went and we've had uh, Fred Gray and Claudette Colvin. Fred Gray was the attorney for Miss Rosa Parks and for Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Fred Gray is also a member of the Lord's Church in Tuskegee. Um, Claudette Colvin actually was Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was not the first person arrested for not giving up her seat. Uh, Claudette Colvin was a 13-year-old girl who was arrested first, uh, but she could not be used uh, for the Montgomery bus boycott because she was 13, she was dark-skinned, and she was having an affair with a married man. And so what Fred Gray did was he decided that they were going to use Rosa Parks because Rosa was a 42-year-old, much fairer-skinned lady, and she was uh, NAACP uh, secretary, so she could handle herself. Um, just a little tidbit, do not ever believe that Rosa just didn't want to give up that seat one day. Uh, Fred Gray will tell you that it was strategic. They, they wanted that route, that bus stop, that bus driver because they knew that it would accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. Um, we've hosted, let's see, uh, Wheeler Parker Jr. Anybody familiar with the name Emmett Till at all? Emmett Till, uh, 13-year-old murdered in Money, Mississippi. Uh, for supposedly whistling at a white lady at a grocery store. If you, if you follow the news at all, she actually recanted a few months ago uh, and, and said that she made the whole thing up. Wheeler Parker is the cousin of Emmett Till, and he was in the bed literally right next to him when they came to get Emmett. Uh, other than the lady that, that accused him, he's the last living eyewitness. Um, we have hosted Diane Nash. Uh, anybody know who Diane Nash is? Okay, awesome. Uh, you familiar with uh, Selma, the March on Selma? At all, Diane Nash organized that. She was the uh, mother of the Freedom Rides. Uh, a lot of work there in Nashville. Um, probably the m- most fam- well, last year we had Andrew Young, uh, close friend and confidant of, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's actually on the balcony with Dr. King when he's assassinated, uh, would later become the mayor of Atlanta and U.S. ambassador for Jimmy Carter. And I think the, probably the most f- recognizable uh, guests that we've had is John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Uh, from the 68 Olympics. Uh, we hosted those two. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know these two guys from the picture that just flashed. Jeff, show that, show that picture again just to make sure we know who we're, who we're talking about. Yeah. Lot, lots of you probably <laughs> seen this picture, uh, and these two men were brought to campus. And yeah, I would, I would probably assert that that may have been the most powerful uh, experience that I've had. <clears throat> One of the things I love about it is that we get them in a couple of days early, and I get to spend a lot of time with these people. I hear from, you know, Fred Gray and Terrence Roberts like once a month. Um, it's, it's amazing. But these two, these two gentlemen have a story that if you aren't familiar with, uh, it's, it's a whole lot more than some raised fists. You know, one of these gentlemen uh, lost their wife to suicide because of all the things that came afterwards. Um, they, were, they, they had to, would have to race horses to make money because the U.S. Olympic team owned them. And they, I mean, there's a lot of... A lot of things there, but uh, probably the most powerful uh, experience that I had with History Speaks was with these two guys. Yeah. So you've, you've spoken with a lot of people uh, and done, not just had conversations with these people, but done 
uh, <laughs> lots of lots of research as well. You, you take students on a on a diversity tour uh, mm -hmm. that that goes through through Memphis yeah. and different parts of Arkansas and. I, yeah, Tell us a <coughs> small bit about that. Yeah, every spring break I take a group of students on a civil rights movement tour. Uh, we take a group of about 30 to uh, Little Rock, Memphis, Tuskegee, Birmingham, uh, Montgomery, Selma, Jackson, Mississippi, and back, um, just retracing the movement. And, and we hit every museum and every uh, historical site and uh, get a chance to teach a lot of students uh, some things that really aren't being taught in our public schools anymore. So I want to be really clear that when I when I thought I wanted to have a conversation, thinking thinking over the summer about all the topics that we would cover, and thinking uh, what are the different topics that will be that will be powerful and, and important to cover, uh, race was a conversation that that came across my mind. So who would be the best person? And so I want to be very clear that uh, I I've. I've known Gary for a while, but I did not bring him here uh, to talk about race simply because he's a black man that I know. Uh, Gary's an amazing man, uh, but Gary is here because he has been engaged in the conversation that I have pretty actively avoided. And so he is, I believe Gary is, is the right man to have the conversation, having heard from lots of these voices I believe Gary's become a, a, a leading voice in this uh, in this conversation himself. So, I, I, again, after just after all that, the, just the just the weight of, of people that you've you've been on stage with, mm -hmm. and so I just appreciate you, you. Uh, and humbled to share the stage with you tonight. It's it's a, a really a great honor. So, based on on all of your all of your experience, mm -hmm. let's <coughs> just start big picture. Okay. Where where are we today? Um, as a as a country, okay. We're, this this is not going to go off into the weeds and right. talking about sp any specific yeah. people necessarily. But yeah. but is is there a, is there a big picture? Not to avoid anything, but is there a big picture that you can that you can kind of talk to where we are right now in terms of race relations in this country? Yeah, um, can I be honest with you guys? Okay, I didn't. I just had to make sure I knew where I was. Um, let, me, let me give you a little bit of context for me. I'm, I'm a preacher's kid. Uh, I've known churches all I've known all my life. Uh, assistant, uh, a minister for my dad there at the Eastside Congregation in Oklahoma City. I've been a deacon for years. I know church people. Um, so back to your question in that context, where are we as a country? We're at a, we're at a, we're at a bad place, but in some ways we're in the same place. Um, and, and if I can kind of drill down into a little more micro yeah. uh, to that, I would say as a church, we're in a bad place, and in a lot of ways, we're in the same place. Um, I, one, one of the things I think for me that has been, I think I'll tell you, I, I wouldn't say disappointing, I think enlightening is uh, just the, the, there were some church people they don't look like me, who I feel very differently about now uh, in the last maybe four to six years. Um, we've become more comfortable saying things that we used to have enough respect for each other not to say out loud, mm -hmm. even if we had those evil thoughts. Uh, we've become more comfortable doing things uh, that we used to wouldn't. We, we, we had enough decency to be not right at home, just not out in public. Uh, and I think we've become, as a country, very comfortable in a place that God never meant us to be comfortable in. Mm -hmm. um, I think in a time where the church has an opportunity to be a leading voice, I think we, we're doing what we've always done, and that's be silent. Um, I believe wholeheartedly that silence is, is perceived consent. Um, Kevin says something to me, and I think you heard it, and you don't say anything to him about it. I believe that you agree with him. Now, you may not have ever heard him, but I perceive you to agree with him because you never corrected him. And for so long, and, and again, this is, I, I want to look at it from a, a country and a church standpoint, we haven't said a word. And all of a sudden, 
we're wondering why things are the way that they are. Um, I, I, was, I was sharing with Kevin. I don't know how many of you all know the name K.K. Mitchell. Anybody familiar with the name K.K. Mitchell? K.K. Mitchell was a minister at the Southside Church of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama. He was the, uh, you know, he was the Park Plaza of Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, imagine in the 1950s and 60s, a black congregation with over 1,000 members. He was the man. He had all the social capital in, in, in Montgomery. Uh, the, the, the Claudette Coburn situation happens, Rosa Parks, they make it happen, and they decide they're going to bust boycott. They meet in the Holt Street Church, uh, Fred Gray says, let's get K.K. Mitchell. He, he, he runs the city, right? He's got all the, the, the social you know, influence, and you know, we're going to do this boycott. And K.K. Mitchell says, I'll do it. Goes back to his elders, and his elders say, yeah, you can go lead the bus boycott, but you won't be preaching at this church. Oh, you know how we do, right? Either you're going to be a preacher or you're going to be involved in the community as if you can't really. Mm -hmm. So K.K. goes back to the church, and, uh, I mean, he goes back to the meeting, and he tells him, listen, I, I, I can't loot. This is how I feed my family. I will lend all of my social capital if you find somebody else. There's a lady at the meeting who says, listen, we just hired this new 26-year-old guy. He speaks really well if you tell him what to say. You guys did know that Martin Luther King didn't write most of his speeches, right? A guy by the name of James Bevel, uh, husband to Diane Nash, right? Um, that's why the whole I have a dream thing, he goes up. Y'all know that story? Okay, never mind. Uh, you do know that that was not on script, right? I have a dream. Okay, anyway, so uh, they go and they get him, bring him down, and the rest is history. But imagine how different society would be or our movement would be if a Church of Christ preacher was leading the civil rights movement. Man, I don't, I don't know what would happen, but just, just imagine, I mean, what could be, right? And, it, and, it, it, and it, the, the thing that, that saddens me is that it didn't happen, be, not because of some sort of societal, it was a church issue that kept it from happening. And a lot of times I feel like, you know, we, we are where we are because we can't, we can't get past church things to care enough. Yeah, that's probably way more than what you're asking, no, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, so... So you mentioned the, the term uh, silence is perceived consent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's kind of one one presumption that's gotten us to this place. Uh, are there any other kind of overarching presumptions that that we have made as a country mm -hmm. um, that that have lent to where we are today? Yeah, um, I think that we have grossly misdiagnosed ourselves as all being objective. Mm. I mean, you're hard-pressed to find a, a person who, I mean, everybody thinks that they have the best intentions all the time, and that's not necessarily the case. No, we're not all objective, um, and, and I think that that's contributed to it as well. I think another thing that has contributed to it is some of our rhetoric. Um, I think we say things that sound good that mean nothing. They're really churchy. What's an example of <clears throat> the term? Like the, that? Well, the term, ra the, the phrase racial reconciliation is really churchy. I absolutely hate hearing it. We, we, it's really, it sounds really good, right? You know, we're going to have this summit on racial reconciliation. We're going to get back. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. To reconcile something means to take it back to a state at which it once was. So let's explore our country's history. There was slavery. I'm just talking about when, when we got here. Slavery, into Jim Crow. I mean, we can march all the way through between the civil rights, the, 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 the war in Vietnam, where, where, where black men came back, addicted to things, the war on drugs, the school to prison pipeline. You could just, my point to you is this. Show me where in our country's history I should be anxious to go back to. Sounds really good and churchy. But the reality is that it never was good for people of color in this country. So the reality is that we're not, we shouldn't be interested in racial reconciliation. We have to be interested in creating a blueprint. It's never happened in our country's history. And the reality is that we as Christians have to say, you know what, it's never happened, but we got to be willing to roll up our sleeves and make it happen. 
but, but it sounds good, right? It's, it's like if I walked in, I'm like, you know, I say something like, I'm treating everybody the same today. You know, I, I know I've been wrong before. I'm treating everybody the same. Everybody's like, hip, hip, hooray. But there's an old saying that says if, if, if everyone is treated equally, the unequal remain unequal. Sounds good if I say, I'm walking in, I'm giving everybody in here $10 a day. And everybody's like, oh, he's great, great man. But what happens if Kevin walked in with a 20 in his pocket? Y'all got $10, he got 30. What changed about the paradigm? Sounded good, but what really changed? So I think we have to be very careful of, of church, churchy rhetoric that means nothing. Yeah, to me, it's a very different journey. If, I am, if I'm aimed at, at a road of reconciliation mm -hmm. versus a road of creation, mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's a very different path in my head because at reconciliation, I'm, I'm looking around for, for the postmark, postmark signs yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Get, to get back to it. I think we're trying to, and, but and that, and that and there's that, a ro give me those two roads again. I like the way you did that. Yeah, the, yeah. The but two, but but there's like a road right in here, right in between, right. And that road is healing. We can't create anything until we heal first. And healing is not necessarily reconciliation. Um, healing is acknowledgement. Uh, healing is being completely open and honest about what's going on in our country. I was just watching. Uh, and I shouldn't do this. I was watching the news, and I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just watching the news, and I won't, I won't say which, but there was a particular uh, uh, um, major news station where a, a newscast was in, in trouble because he made the assertion that white supremacy does not exist. It's a myth. Anybody else see that on the news? Okay, yeah. And I'm, I'm like, man, what world is he living in? Right? But if we can't even acknowledge that there is hurt, how can we ever heal? But I, I think our focus first and foremost, should be on healing and then into that lane of creation. But, but come on. I'm listening. If, if people would just stop talking about it. Mm. That's true too. If people would just stop talking about race so much, then race wouldn't be a problem. It's, it's the people that talk about it. Right? I mean. Yeah. Have you, have you heard I, that before? All the time. Twice a day. <laughs> um, so how, how do you respond to those that, that might say... Well, it depends on what day it is. No, I'm yeah. just playing. <laughs> um, that, let's go with a good day. A, yeah, a really good a day. And day. somebody says, it, just, yeah. if you would just stop talking about it, then, then it wouldn't be a problem. We're, we, live in, we live in a very uh, unracist country. Oh, yeah. A post-racial, colorblind society. Yeah. So just stop talking about it. Yeah. How, wh what's a what's a a good day, Gary? Response to? <laughs> no, I'm not a bad <laughs> no, person. No, 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 really, no, no, honestly. No, no, no. Um, I, I I get I've come to know that people who tend to make that comment to me, um, they haven't realized that th that the conversation of race for them is optional. But for me, it's a matter of survivability. Um, anybody familiar with W.B. Du Bois at all? So Du Bois has a book called The Souls of Black Folk. Anybody wrote it, read it? Should read it. It's really thin, maybe about 90 pages. Um, but there's a concept that he talks about in this book called double consciousness. And it's crazy because this is written like literally at the turn of the century, and it's a timeless deal. But he, really quickly, yeah. this double consciousness, he makes the argument that there are two people that as a black person you have to be in this country. There's the African Negro, and he calls him the American Negro. And he says the African Negro represents your pride and your history and your strength and your perseverance. And the American Negro represents uh, a hope and power and what could become. And he says you can't merge the two because if you, if you do, you lose one for the other. And so the assertion that he makes is that there's one person that you have to be at home to survive and another person you have to be out in the public to survive. And by golly, I tell you, in 2019, that's still true. There's a Gary I have to be at home for my wife and my three girls or at my church, you know, for the, for the fatherless boys I got to work with. But when I get to 2501 East Memorial Road and I step onto that campus, I got to be a different kind of guy. And I don't have a choice of merging those two because for me, it's a matter of survival ability. Um, and so I, what, I've, what I've done for my own well-being sometimes is I, I remove myself from some of those conversations. Um, because I think when, when, when that's kind of our, our, our 
launching pad. Um, I don't know how fruitful that conversation could be. And, I, and I'll also say this, and I'll, I'll say this to anybody. You, you don't need to be having conversations of race with everybody. I don't think you need to feel like you owe everybody an explanation. Um, if you find yourself engaging in a situation that's not fruitful, move on. I say all the time, you're not going to change the world. But you can influence the seven or eight people in your circle of influence. And if those seven people go influence seven more people, now you start seeing meaningful change in the world in which you operate. Um, man, there's so much, so much to go there. So we talk about a, looking at a, at a path forward mm -hmm. um, and, and what that, we talked a little bit about what that looks like. Um, what, does, what does a path forward, uh, I hope this, hope this makes sense to you and to everybody else, what does that path not look like? What are things that we maybe think we need to do yeah. to do to jump on right away that they're really not yeah. it's they're the they're the they're the minors in the major yeah, that in makes, the major problem. That makes no sense. No, I'm just messing with you. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. Well, ah, I'm not ah, good. So, crazy. So, no, I'm messing so with you. Bear with me. Um what it what it what it doesn't look like and I, man, y'all don't hate me when I'm done, I promise. What it was <laughs> it what it doesn't look like is this church going and finding a black church and merging and becoming one church. Mm. That's what we think the answer is all the time. Let's get together and have worship together. And we're going to sing songs that y'all don't know, and we're going to sing songs that y'all don't know, and it's going to be awkward. Come on, man. I mean, we've been there. There was an effort in, in, in the, in, back in Oklahoma City that, 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 that man, I, I tried. I promise you I tried. It just was. I was there. You, you tried. I, I promise. I tried. I really did. <laughs> but it was brutal. It was brutal to, to, to I mean, we, we, we would go and we'd say stuff to each other like, man, this is a great turnout. We got 700 people here tonight. And I'm thinking to myself, like, well, to, I was talking to a buddy at the white church, like, well, y'all had 2,500 in here by yourselves this morning. So if you got six black churches in here with you and we ain't got but 700, I mean, let's, let's talk real here. Percentage-wise, this ain't really y'all's idea. But I don't, think that, I don't think that's the answer because I believe that, that, I believe the Bible is very clear. I believe God is very intentional that, I can say it because he's my buddy. Uh, I believe that God placed North Peoria, in that area to minister to, that, to those people. I believe Park Plaza is where Park Plaza is. I believe North Sheridan is where North Sheridan is. I believe Virgin Street is where... I believe, I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, I don't think that's the answer because the, the, the problem I had with that was we get together, do this song and dance, this pon dog and pony show, and I see you Tuesday in Walmart and you don't even speak to me. Hey, do I know you? Like, yeah, I'm the only black dude that was up leading singing. <laughs> like, like, what do you mean you don't know me? Right? Um, I don't think that's the answer. It, it doesn't look like that. It, it, it doesn't look like um, anything artificial, right? And, and the key to all of this, I think, is being intentional without being artificial. Yeah. You know, you got to do it on purpose, but you can't be fake with it. Um, I don't think it needs to be Sunday, Wednesday stuff. I just don't. I think you need to, you need to, you need to be getting with people throughout the week, having a meal, uh, we, 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 one of the things that I, that I struggled with with that deal was there were people, a part of that deal, who our kids were in the same class. And we can be at school events. Hey, it's like they don't even know you. I'm like, well, man, thanks, brother. Hmm. Right? So I think it, it, it's not what we, what we want to make it, the corporate worship, big kumbaya, hold hands. That's, hmm. that's not real. What, what's, what's real to me is when, when I'm... I'm um, moving into a neighborhood and I'm the only black family and I see your face in the neighborhood, I'm so thrilled because I know I know you're my brother, my sister in Christ, and I know if nothing else, I'm going to get a fair shake from you. Um, I, what it looks like is, is being willing to, to help change systems. Because when we talk race, we're not talking, yeah, people, yeah. but systems are, are what, what drive this thing, right? Yeah. Um, but Du Bois also says you can't get from a system that which it was not designed to give, I'm afraid that we're trying to get an answer out of a system that wasn't set up to give that answer. I don't think anybody ever thought, what, what happens when we free the slaves? Because they weren't supposed to be free. So mechanisms weren't put in place. Um, and I, I feel like we're trying to get an answer from something that doesn't exist. So again, we've got to roll up our sleeves, uh, find some friends across the aisle, find some friends that don't look like us, and be intentional about it and know that it's not going to be easy. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be awkward sometimes. Yeah. I was telling Kevin as we were talking, one of the issues that, that we had in the city was um, 
It's easy to think it's 2019, all that stuff is beyond us. The elders at my congregation went to segregated schools. Like, we're not that far, far removed uh, from, from, from all of that. And so when you, when you come to the table and you say, let's do this thing, they're very skeptical, and rightfully so. Uh, there's, there's been a movement that's, that's been happening uh, a little bit in Tulsa. Uh, it's called Unite My City. Some of you have, have been involved in, in some things and seen different things. Uh, a guy named Jason Law, who has this amazing ministry in town that's, that's looking to reconcile churches, uh, not just, I say, like I said, the word reconcile, but... It's okay, man. You can say it, <laughs> but, I promise but, you. Uh, <laughs> it, looking, to, looking to bring together churches that don't normally get together and, and not, just, not just racially different, but, but different in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. He's trying to bring church together. And, and we were, some of our elders, ministers, we, we met with Jason. So the question I ended up coming up with after several conversations and meetings and uh, and different different group gatherings was okay so i I want things to be better mm-hmm. like i i I have an, that honest desire in my heart for things to be right. good so where does the responsibility lie and here here's the two options i that i the the two options that were in my head as limited as my thinking is here, the two options that I had come up with were does the predominantly white church go to the black church and say, and forgive the terminology if, it's, if, that's, if that's hard for you to no, get I know, I know but you're because yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're with me. Um, <laughs> does the white church go to the black church and say, man, a lot has happened and we don't think it's right and we want to make things better and we want our relationship to be better. Here's how we would like to offer to, to fix this problem or to help mm. this problem. Or the other side is the black church saying, here's what we think would be helpful mm-hmm. from, our, from our brothers and sisters across the city, and the white church saying, yes, I'm going to buy into what you have, mm-hmm. ha- have you, you have decided. D- does that, <coughs> does the differentiation make sense there? Yeah. Where, where does the responsibility lie to, to initiate the, this solution? That's, that's a great question. Let, let me back you up just a little bit. Sure. Um, I think the difficulty... You kind of, just the microcosm was just, just squelching when you said black and white church. Some people are uncomfortable with those terms. Mm-hmm. Um, I was telling Kevin, I, you very rarely will hear me use the term African-American. I use black. I'm black, you're white, we're Americans. I think it's interesting we don't call white people Russian-Americans or German-Americans or wherever y'all came from. I, I mean, I, I've never been to Africa. I was born in Louisiana, raised in Michigan, live in Oklahoma the last 15 years. I just, I'm black, you know, and, and, I'm, and you're white. We're both equally American. Um, I think that, I think the reality is that you have to, you have to be willing to a, acknowledge, right, that there's an issue. I, I think, for the sake of this conversation, uh, I think that the white church has to be willing to acknowledge the disparity and, and, you, and go to the black church and say, I'm, I'm willing to help and bridge this gap in any way, but it's your call as to how we bridge this gap. Um, you don't get you don't get to stab me and then tell me how to heal. Uh, I cope with it as best as I can. Let me let me let me. I don't I don't know anything about this church's response to this, but I'm going to use this as an example. Um, Terrence Crutcher, anybody know that name? I just want you to think individually. What was your response to the Terrence Crutcher situation, and then individually think. What did I hope my church would have done in that situation? I don't know what you did or didn't do, so I'm just, I mean, I can feel good about asking that, right? But individually, what, what, what was your response? And then did, what did you say to yourself? Man, I, I sure hope Park Plaza does this. I sure hope we say this. I sure hope we can walk alongside. Warren Blakeney, is a senior minister at, 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 uh, at uh, North Peoria, was the president of the Tulsa NAACP for years, all over CNN. How many, of, how many of us thought about, let me go down here and figure out how I can help, provide some resources? They're standing down at the, at the courthouse and, pro- can we take a meal? Can we, what can we do to walk, walk alongside? Can we, maybe when the cameras are gone, you know, stop by and say, hey, what can we do in the meanwhile? What can we, I mean, but then again, you would have had to feel a certain way about in the first place. Um, but I think the responsibility, I think in any system, the responsibility falls upon the person in power. 
this is probably oversimplified, but slavery doesn't end because black people got tired of working. It just didn't. If that was the case, it ended a long time ago. Slavery ends because someone in power, a, a white guy, says to a white guy, this is wrong, and I'll fight you over it, literally. Now, whatever the reasonings were, systems don't change until people in power say to other people in power, we got to change this. Problem with that, is that you got to be willing to give up your power to change the system. And we don't like to talk about the other P word, privilege. Got to be willing to give up some of it if I want to. I mean, this is a church, right? Uh, Philippians 2, Kenosis Doctrine, right? Jesus comes down from the cross. The Bible says he considers it not robbery. He gives up everything in heaven, comes down, takes on the form of a man, humbles himself even to the cross, he dies for us. This same chapter says at the, at the end, every knee shall bow. At the end, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I ask myself, if every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess anyway, why did you come down to the cross? I mean, because we're going to confess, we're going to bow anyway, right? He came for everybody but him. Mm-hmm. And at some point, nothing will change until you're willing to do something for everybody but you. When's the last time you made a decision that does not benefit you at all? Mm. Man, let me do something for everybody else. I'm going to get in. And I, G, the thing I love about Jesus knew going in, it's not like he got down and was like, oh, well, oh, well I guess I'll just take it the way it is. He knew what the deal was from the, from the jump. We struggle to get into situations where we know that everybody will benefit but us from that. Let me read a couple mm-hmm. lines here. And, and no, that's not fair. That's not fair. Let me, read, read, let me read my mind oh. in, in a... In I thought certain, you had some kind of talent. We were about to go make some money. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not just laughs> um, <laughs> what ministry is that? <laughs> the Dion Warwick ministry yes, here is not a special right. right. <laughs> uh, So, you, you said a minute ago, you, you can't stab me and tell me how to heal. That's, a, that's, a, that's a powerful terminology, and I don't disagree with it, but... Uh, at the same time, I th- man, I didn't. You didn't personally stab me. I didn't do it. You're right. You're I right. Didn't, so, I mean, I, mm-hmm. to say I got to give up power, it's mm-hmm. like I, I've, not, I've never tried. I personally, Gary, have never tried to hold power yeah. over you. Right. So, so how do you, how do you, yeah. So, yeah, so how do we reconcile this, this like personal <laughs> conviction that I'm not, I personally don't see myself in the wrong. Mm hmm. But you're telling me there's a system that's broken that I'm a part of. Yeah. So, so there's a guy. Well, he, uh, he's the deceased now. His name was Dr. Samuel D. Proctor. He was a uh, theologian and a uh, HBCU president. But he, he talks about this. He used to talk about this concept of something called a scratch line, right? And he talks about these these things that he was inherently he just he just he was just born into with no, no, no doing of his own. He talked about his parents uh, uh, being college graduates and being, uh, him learning to play the piano and speaking several languages and all these things that he inherited on his own. He talked about how his buddies up the street had none of it, right? But, but what, he, what he says is that those of us who inherited surplus that we didn't earn have a responsibility to help those who inherited deficit that they didn't earn. And while, mm-hmm. while, while, and I agree with you, uh, and that's why I wanted to get us back to systems and not individuals, right? While you did not personally stab me, or while you did not personally, the other thing you get all the time is, well, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't own slaves. I didn't make you drink out of a fountain. You, you, you're right, but, but you're, you are living in the surplus of generations mm-hmm. while I'm still clawing back from the deficit of generations. We, one of the easiest ways to look at it, I don't think you can have a conversation about race without talking socioeconomics. You can't. Um, I'll give you a great example. This is, let me tell you, this is my first time. This is beautiful. This is, like, I just want to get a sleeping bag and sleep. Like, this is nice, <laughs> right? Um, I've, I've been to black congregations that are 1,500, 2,000 members um, in this country, and the facilities don't look like this because they don't have the capital that you have, because they don't have the generational wealth that you have. Generational, generational wealth does not exist among blacks in America. Why? Because, because you, <laughs> we ain't been free that long. Um, you look at somebody like Oprah, 
or Beyonce, I'm saying names y'all probably don't even know, Michael Jordan, right? The wealthiest of black people in our country didn't come from wealthy parents. They did not inherit that wealth. And so while we can have fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation millionaires that are Caucasian in this country or white, that doesn't exist among blacks, right? And so when we talk about socioeconomics, we start talking about public school systems and the disparities and things like that. It's, 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 it's night and day, right? And it started that way. Blacks came to this country as a, as a, as a part of a business proposition. It wasn't bringing black people. You were bringing in the equivalent of a John Deere tractor. He just happened to use the bathroom and, and, and cry. The only, the only point I will make uh, to that point, uh, and the only time we will probably and probably should, the only time mention the name Donald Trump tonight, uh, is... You just, it, I'm leaving. You, no, <laughs> you, you, you no, said no, no. it. No, I messing so with you, man. I, I heard Donald Trump say something that, that has nothing to do with his presidency uh, or anything, <laughs> a, much else that he said, but I remember him saying early on, uh, maybe it's even during, during his campaign, said, I, I work so hard for everything that I have mm-hmm. um, that he, that almost, almost kind of ground up kind of thing, worked so hard for everything he has. He said his... His, I mean, his dad only gave him like it was like a million dollar loan from yeah. his dad. That's all he. That's all he got. That's that's horrible. And then and then everything else was all. And <laughs> I, mean, I just thought you are from a different world than but, I am. But, but that's that, his. So, but that's his context, right? That's his context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, but again, it goes back to systems. That goes back to systems. Even the systems that we have put in place in our country to try to help alleviate, right? You look at something like affirmative action. Has anybody ran the numbers on affirmative action to see who the ben- greatest benefactors of affirmative action has, have been? It's not black men, not black women, white women. You want to look at minority business loans, greatest benefactors, white women, because after a while, women were uh, classified as a protected class. And so what white male business owners would do is tell their wives, go get a loan in your name. Now we expand the business. She has better credit than I have because she came from. So even the systems that we put in place to to try to help um, they just don't seem to work in this country. We are quickly running out of time. I'm sorry, but I talk so no, much. No, 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 no. This is I, I, I appreciate every bit of it. Um, real, real quick, and mm-hmm. then we'll get to. There's one last slide I want you to, to go yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, but um, what what's the what's the ultimate goal? If we don't know where we're headed, we don't know how to get there. Is can you paint in about? 45 seconds, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. a, a picture of what would be oh, a really good place to find ourselves. I think a really good place to find ourselves is to be perceived by the, and I'll use the world, that's a yeah. term, the, world, the outside yeah. world, right? I think to be perceived as if there is nobody else in this world that gets it, the Church of Christ gets it. If there's nowhere else I can go, I know I can go there. I know they're going to treat me right. I know they're going to fight for me. I know they're going to they're sacrifice for me, right? Th- to me, that's the ultimate pie in the sky goal. Now, if, if, if we're not all pulling in the same direction, if it's not about God getting the glory and the church getting the glory, if it's about, you know, you, you, you know me personally being recognized for something, it's never going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, never going to work at all. But I think our, our, our end game has to be making the church what the church needs to be. I don't know. I don't think we can ever make the world what it needs to be, but I think if we can make the church what the church needs to be, I, I think God will do the rest. I was going to have you uh, explain and, and uh, talk about a verse, but I think mm-hmm. you just did. Uh, John thirteen thirty five. For they will know you are my disciples, not, not just by your love, by your love for one another. Um, and that's not just the people that you like. It's not just the people that, that look like you. It's not just the people that society says you should, you should love. You know, I mean... Um, because the world does that. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean the world, the world the, loves and, people that are, that are and, like them. And the church does that too. I mean, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean yeah, yeah. Acts 9, right? Peter is, is, is uh, uh, he's about to run into Cornelius. Uh, when he when he gets uh, gets to ten, but he I think it was like verse forty three, really small verse said it. He but he he spent some time with Simon the Tanner, 
He stayed with them for several days, right? If you know what a tanner is, a tanner is, a, is a, it was the undesirable. They were the stinky people. Lived out by the sea because they would take the animal skins and turn them into leather and it stunk and they needed to be near the sea for the, for the, the one person that nobody wanted to be with, he went and hung out with for days. And I think if something that was going to change in the church, you got to start spending some time with people that other people think you shouldn't be spending time with. A lot of time. Yeah. Intentional time. Yep. I want to talk so much more. Let's, Jeff, pull up that slide uh, and, and tell us. Well, I should have worn my glasses. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of words on the slide. Oh, yeah. But, so, so it's right behind you. So, so I, I, I would love us to be able glasses. to go away with a couple things in our pocket. Um, yeah, this, so this is something that I use on, on campus. Um, and, and I just, it's, it's something that I think is, is really, uh, it's really, it really works for us. It's an eight point pledge, and just eight ways I think you can really, really make a difference. Number one, speak out, right? I would not let racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic or other stereotypical comments continue in conversations without objecting to them. If I'm a witness or I'm the victim of discrimination, I will speak out. You got to start saying something. You got to start. And what you'll find out is when you speak up, the people who don't agree with you, they'll leave you. You ain't got to worry about leaving them. They're going to leave you because they're uncomfortable now. I'm just being honest with you. Number two, learn about other people. Meet new people and learn about different cultures and lifestyles, right? Um, Expose yourself to something other than, the, than, than what you are used to. Uh, number three, learn about yourself. Listen, you cannot really understand anybody else until you understand yourself. If you come from a background of people who've always been involved with, 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 with great race relations, embrace it. If you come, some, some, of, some of us will have some backgrounds that's not pretty. We are in the South. But you know what? Embrace that and, and make the declaration that you're going to be different. Number four, examine my attitudes. Be aware of your own ideas, words, and actions that denigrate others and eliminate them from your life. I will speak and act as someone who respects others. One of the things I think is interesting about the golden rule, right? Um, do unto others as you have them do unto you, right? Is, is said by who? G yeah, I was, Jesus, right? Okay, I just make sure we say about yeah. Jesus, the same, right? The, right? The same guy, Jesus. the same guy who knows he's on his way to to, to to a cross, is telling people, "Do want to treat people right, even though I know you're not going to treat me right. Treat people right, even when they can't treat when they don't have the capacity mm -hmm. to treat you right. I have to work on that. When I know somebody is bigoted, when I know what time it is when you come to the conversation, to still treat you right when I know you have nothing good for me in your spirit." Number five, be informed about the issues, right? Uh, attend lectures and read literature and, and podcasts and film and things like that. You need to read some books. How many people read the book, The New Jim Crow? Slavery by Another Name. White Fragility. You need to be reading. The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Somebody needs to read it. James Cone, you need to read that. Um, very powerful parallels between the cross that, that would be in the front yard of blacks burning and the cross that Jesus was hung upon. Um, but a very, very powerful, powerful book about the, 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 the uh, intersection of theology and race in our country. Uh, celebrate our differences, right? I will enjoy a variety of people and cultures in the world. I would try new foods and listen to different kind of music and participate in other cultures. I, I mean, that's, that's one of the things, I mean, I like Chris Stapleton. <laughs> Gavin DeGraw, like I'm, y'all, anybody know, the, that's not real country is what they tell me. That's right, that's not okay. real country. That's about as, I'm trying, man. <laughs> I'm, I promise you. But I like that Chris Stapleton, though. He, yeah, he, he need a haircut, but I think, he, um. Yeah, yeah. Number seven, treat people as individuals, right? I will not make assumptions on others based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, economic status, religion, et cetera. I will get to know people by listening to their viewpoint and what they say about, them sell, uh, by, uh, about themselves and by, and by telling them about myself. Spend more time listening than you do talking. Spend more time listening than you do talking. And one lastly, thing, one thing, last thing, one thing I've seen all over the world, and this is a statement that, that I think is true, groups are different. People are the same. When you start to get to know individuals, you realize how, how much in common you have far mm. quicker than you'll, you'll see all you, how crazy different you are. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and let me say this really quick. I, I think it's important, too, that you embrace the difference, right? Right. Color blindness is terrible. I hate when people say, I don't see color. Yes, you do. <laughs> and I want you to. God made me this way. 
right? People, we're all like a bucket of balls, right? And every ball represents a part of me. When you tell me to toss out my race, my color, my ethnicity, where I come from, and we're just all one, you, you've taken out five balls out of my bucket, hand me the bucket, and then tell me to understand who I am. That didn't work like that. Embrace the uniqueness and the difference. Yeah. And then lastly, be a part of the solution. I will talk to others about how to respond to important issues, and I will organize and join groups to educate myself and others about the value of diversity and promote positive social action and learn to love and respect others. We made it. We made it. Uh, and, we're, and we're over time, like, I'm sorry. I, thought, like I thought we might be. Um, I normally would have some, uh, try to have some final statement that I'd want everybody to go with. That's it. Um, Gary, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to close. I'm going to close with a prayer uh, over Gary, uh, but I want to invite you all back next week. Uh, we have another friend of mine coming up from Edmond. Uh, he he preaches at a little church uh, in town. His name's Phil Brookman. <laughs> uh, he uh, little church, huh? a, a little church. I got you. Uh, he Phil Brookman's the <laughs> preacher at the Memorial Road Church of Christ and. Uh, and, and he's one of my dearest friends, and so Phil and I will sit at this table next week. I really want to encourage you to come back uh, and, and be a part of that conversation as well. Uh, Gary, I can't thank you enough uh, for being here. Let me say a prayer over you and us, and we'll, we'll be adjourned for Thank tonight. you for having me. Lord, we are, we are grateful for the times that, that you um, help open our eyes to ways that we can grow and change to be more like your son, yes. uh, who, who did something for everybody but himself. Uh, we're grateful for, uh, for, for faithful men like Gary, uh, who, are, uh, who are faithful to you and, and to his beautiful family and to his church, uh, who, who, can so, who can so well bring to us um, ideas that, that, that help us grow and help us become... Um, the disciples that, that we need to be in order to show a world who you really are. Uh, I pray uh, safety on his, on his travel back, on his, on his family. Uh, I, I pray safety for, um, for us as we travel home. Uh, I'm grateful for the time we're able to spend here tonight. Thank you for your presence in this place tonight, Father. Uh, we love you. We we'll pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are just going to, thanks for being here.